Okay. Lovely. So now I'd like to, first of all, so the, the evening, uh, Chris Herring will be guiding us through it. It will consist of, of speaking, of looking at three different uh, uh, areas, uh, three different countries and how they have, uh, how they're taking forward the retrofit agenda. But before we do that, we always like to start with a testimony from uh, one of our brave rebels who, um, as part of Interlake Britain, have taken the step towards uh, non uh, taking forward non-direct, non-violent direct action to raise um, to raise the issue, which has been uh, a matter that the industry has been concerned about for years, but obviously has just not been able to to make. Or there haven't been very big inroads in making this happen at the speed and uh, with the with the dynamism and the funding that it needs to. So uh, that's enough. You can see how bad I am at this. I'm going to pass you over to, to Shiki, who is one of those who has felt able to sit in the road and um, to raise the issue. Shiki, let me hand over to you. Thanks, Joe. <clears throat> um, yeah, my name is Paul Shiki. Um, bit about my background, I, I thought I was well informed about the climate crisis, um, but it turns out I completely wasn't at all. Uh, and it wasn't until I saw people on the news in April 2019 as part of Extinction Rebellion that they were uh, getting arrested. I thought, what's, what, what's the, the issue of getting arrested for? Why is that so important? And basically I got involved in that and now it's, anyone that knows about the climate crisis and knows the level of urgency that we have of it now um, just can't help be affected by it. You can't unknow it. Uh, so I really dedicated a lot of time to it. Um, so since then, I've been arrested 25 times. Uh, I've been through the High Court. I owe a fair bit of money to National Highways Agency. Um, and at the time when Insight Britain came along, I was really just, just desperate for something to happen. I knew that some the conversation needed to change on this and that no action was being taken and the government's failing and people uh, ordinary people didn't understand the scale of change that's needed uh, even when people talk about insulation now and retrofit they don't understand the scale of it and how this is a massive national project that has to have the full backing of government and the full backing of, of the people of the country so it just really frustrated me that nothing was happening and it just sort of reached the point where I just got completely desperate really like nothing that we were doing was working and then this idea came along that we could sit on the motorway and we could do it day after day after day and until we till we got somewhere with the government and actually got this issue out there and and that's what he did that's what we did and a lot of them, my motivation was anger, really, just the total. I mean, I don't know what the people from other countries might be thinking of us, but the government in Britain now has got to be the worst government in our history. It's totally failing on so many levels um, that it just makes me so angry. And a lot of the motivation was that. And just to be able to do something was a, a pleasure, really, with the uh, the amazing people, the, the small amount of people it took as well, as really less than 100 people just really changed the conversation on insulation. And, and in the whole country now, people are talking about the choice between heating and eating and the cost of living crisis. And we all know this solution to that. One of the key solutions is retrofit and insulation. So it is massively empowering to do this, uh, to do Insulate Britain. And um, but really, it's just came out of a place of great fear of what, what we face in the future um, to know that it's something we need to do. And that there's like there's only a choice between either doing that or the slow decline to civilization collapse. These are the only two choices we have. And the ordinary people don't seem to realize this. So I'm continuing on now with Just Stop Oil. And the next campaign, the follow up campaign from Insight Britain, and we're going to be continuing this August, this October. And now that is an international network, the A22 network. We're aligned with 11 other countries are all 
taking part in high stakes civil disobedience from the 1st of October of this year in 11 different countries. So if anyone's interested in getting involved in activism, then that's the way. Um, is that okay, everyone? Can I pass back to someone? Oh, that's fantastic, Shiki, that's fantastic. Thank you so much for uh, expressing, you know, so clearly where, where your drive to, to make a, a difference has come from. Um, at this stage, I'm going to hand over now to Chris, who's going to masterfully lead us through the rest of, of uh, <laughs> the rest of the of the evening uh, and introduce our speakers and we will we will promise we, we always promise to finish promptly so that 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 is our intention but all of the um all of the presentations obviously it's being recorded and where there are slides those will be shared as well thank you over to you chris thanks jill and um thank you everyone for attending um we've got a, a good turnout not as big as the last one actually but at the moment although more people may come in yet i think um I, this is a really exciting um uh, i think i blame the government chris for that something uh, rather exciting might be happening i think, think that could be the to, yeah I, I know i just missed them <laughs> uh, anyway um yeah so We've had a whole series of webinars. If you've not attended one before, um, they've been running since uh, the autumn of last year. Uh, we've had different styles, uh, but all looking at uh, what we need to do to insulate Britain, really. So retrofitting, you know, and um, really talking, mainly talking to the industry. But I mean, you're welcome wherever you come from. That's fine. Um, and just to try and learn more and share knowledge and also obviously to some extent bolster the you know to round out the reputation in Sweet Britain it's not just about activism although that is the core but also about knowledge and about helping people to understand what they can do so um so I'm Chris Herring I, I'm a businessman working in sustainable uh, construction I've got a company uh, that does that uh, I'm also involved with uh, very much involved with passive house in the UK and with other sustainable initiatives around building I've been for a very long time um, we've got three amazing speakers today we're looking at uh, what's happening basically in Italy in France and in Ireland and we've got Francesco Francesco Nesi we've got Marion uh, I'll let them introduce themselves and bring them on and uh, Matthew so I'm looking around my screen trying to see people um, so just looking at those three areas the structure today is going to be about we're going to have three speakers straight after each other not with questions because it's a tight schedule and I know they've all got more to say than they've got time to say it in so I'm not going to take more than a couple of minutes on this um, so we should get to questions around about 8.15, I think if we're lucky, uh, and have about 10 minutes for questions. So if you do have questions, keep them short, please, because otherwise we just won't have time to read them and, and digest them. We won't get through them all. Put some put key short questions in, in the chat and we'll take it from there and see. We won't get through them all. And we may, we may consider if this is very successful and there's a lot of interest and huge number of questions even coming back to this uh, when we start again. Uh, the series again in, in the autumn. Um, I think that's all I need to say. So I'm going to hand over to Francesco Nesi from near Bolzano to let you introduce yourself, Francesco, although we, we've known each other for a long time through the Pacifist Networks uh, and worked together. So um, I'm going to hand over to you and I shall tell you where you are at about 17 minutes. So you've got an idea of time. Okay, so how does it work with this share? So I'll just share my screen and also the presentation. Oh, and I think yeah. you're a co-host, I think. Okay, so it should work. So can you see Coming it? Up? Yes, we're there. Okay, fine. So just adjust for the people in my screen. Okay, so uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for inviting me. It's a very big pleasure for me to be here and to represent Italy. Um, I'm Francesco Nesi, director of uh, Zephyr Passibaus Italia, so the um, Italian affiliate of the um, uh, Passibaus Institute uh, in Germany. Actually, uh, I was asked to bring our um, our model, our situation in Italy concerning incentives, um, in particular the, the, the big incentive, super bonus, 
which uh, is claimed to give you all the works for free. Let me see. I mean, the, at least this is what the what it was how it was presented in the newspaper in the beginning, and I'll go uh, in detail, um, deeply in detail uh, in a while, and I'll speak about pros and cons whether this is a model to imitate or better to follow France or Ireland. I mean, in the, the, the forthcoming speakers. So let me begin. So I, I must um, start announcing that all buildings in Italy are now in class A, uh, maybe or not. I mean, I don't know. Uh, this is what is being claimed, at least uh, in several newspapers, in the, on TV and so on. But if you look closer to the um, uh, energy labels, the real uh, data behind it, you'll see that uh, independent research uh, done by Le Gambiente showed that, for instance, uh, none of them were was in class A or um, of the investigated ones, of course, uh, and not even in class C. So you can see a lot of thermal bridges, no insulation at all, but I mean, it's very easy in Italy. So you just cheat and you just uh, transform the ad ad announcement of a, a selling uh, so house rent or whatever, uh, the advertisement be, um, is transformed easily from class E uh, to class A. So everything uh, is just announced like that because no control, because uh, I mean, th this holds for everything. So we have a, a really a big lack of control from the state. And that's why in, the, in our building sector, uh, there's a big confusion and it's very difficult for the people to orientate whether uh, they should go for eco, whatever, bio, whatever, sustainable, whatever, eco-friendly, zero carbon emission, ecologic and whatever. So, uh, and moreover, there's a lot of people who commit frauds and it's very uh, difficult to persecute them because our um, yeah, um, juristic system is very tough and long and you never come to an end. So, but let's speak about the present and the past and the future. So you are really, you've already seen this picture so many times, maybe in the past years. Uh, so we are definitely still in the 20th century, so we we, we did not realize uh, yet that uh, new technologies, new approaches such as passive house concept uh, came into play already since more than 25 years. Uh, I'm working. I've been working in Italy for more than 15 years, um, and also in several parts of the world, and just by applying very simple rules. So. Uh, it's false that no solutions are available. Solutions are in front of us. Uh, look what happened in Italy a few days ago. So the Marmolade glacier uh, went, fall, fell down and uh, uh, many people died. This is for sure um, due to the climate, climate change. So we must change the habits and uh, uh, our government uh, started to think about um, measures, retrofit measures, uh, in order to give support to all of uh, all of them, all, all the people interested in um, making the comfort and the energetic situation of a building better than before. So this was in the beginning uh, 2020, uh, where when super bonus and sisma bonus actually um, an incentive uh, for uh, seismic um, measures, uh, the, the both were was first introduced. So I'll speak here and I leave you my slides afterwards. So I just put all the data or the information uh, uh, available. Um, so you can look at them closer uh, in a second um, stage. Uh, now I'm just gonna uh, explain you what the, the rationale behind it uh, was and uh, how it went on in the, in, in, in the course of the time until now. 
Uh, now it's a catastrophical situation here in Italy, but in 2020, we were all excited uh, about this uh, new incentive scheme for renovating both thermal and seismic character of the building. And uh, they said, okay, so if you pay 100 euros, uh, the state gives you back 110. Uh, and everybody were claiming, okay, this is gratis. So this is for free. Every, everything is for free, which is in fact not true. Uh, so the newspapers had a, a major responsibility for uh, the wrong expectations also for the public afterwards, because then we technicians, we had to explain them, no, it's not for free. Uh, they give you back 110% uh, percent, but upon certain conditions and of course this, this was not uh, explained in the beginning from the newspaper from the tv uh, so who can benefit from this contribution so physical persons multifamily buildings especially multifamily buildings institute for low rent housing non-profit organizations and so on how does it work so we have the so-called driving measures and the driven measures. Uh, so the driving measures is subject to 110% uh, incentive as a tax reduction. Uh, if you apply one of these three um, main um, interventions, measures like external uh, thermal insulation on more than 25% of the external surface of the thermal envelope. Uh, if you substitute the generator for heating, cooling, domestic uh, hot water with heat pumps or with other uh, better technological systems, um, or if you mitigate the seismic risk. So if you are uh, applying one of these three major uh, measures, then you will benefit the 110% incentive also for the all driven measures which you are going to apply. Uh, for instance, if you want also to replace the windows, windows are usually uh, financed uh, like 60, 65% back as a tax reduction. Uh, but if you combine them, for instance, with the installation of external uh, um, um, thermal insulation, uh, then you get them also uh, with 110%, uh, uh, which is very nice, of course. And this leads actually to a complete and deep renovation uh, action, which is going to be made to all existing buildings upon the categories we, we, we saw uh, in, the, in the previous slide. So you can replace the windows, solar install solar thermal plants, photovoltaic plants, and combine with the storage system, uh, charging station for electric cars, or concerning the seismic character uh, or architectural barriers, you can um, by a lift, for instance, in order to remove architectural barriers. Everything is comprised within the 110%. Um, but the, the, uh, the idea is to make the uh, classes, energetic or seismic classes of the building better, uh, so two classes better than the existing to the, to the current situation. This is not always possible, of course, depending on the boundary conditions you are working on, but mostly you can really approach uh, big performances in the, in the buildings you are going to refurbish. Think about it, you can get, uh, it's not for free, but let's say almost for free, uh, external thermal insulation. Then you can change the windows. You can change the heating generator with heat pumps. You can install photovoltaic system combined with, uh, uh, with the storage, with the battery. And uh, I mean, you are done actually. So you have a full electric uh, house and uh, actually you got everything almost for free. Not really, but because there are some uh, maximum amounts uh, by category, which uh, is going to be are going to be financed. For instance, uh, concerning the driving measures, so the bigger ones, 
uh, thermal insulation, for instance, uh, for one single dwelling unit, you get 50,000 euros uh, back. So if you pay 60,000 euros, then you get 50,000 for free and 10,000 euros you pay uh, yourself, which is not bad actually. Uh, and if you are nice and good in designing everything and you pay 49,000 euros, you get everything for free. Then the newspapers were almost right, but uh, actually uh, a lot of false expectation uh, had been arised from, from the first uh, promotion in, the, in the, the web. Or you can substitute the existing heat generator with condensing boiler class A or heat pumps or micro cogeneration or solar thermal plants and you get uh, these other qualities, for instance, for one single dwelling unit, 30,000 euros. Uh, but pay attention that these um, amounts are referred to uh, prices, including VAT and technical expenses. This means that you never get everything for free. Uh, only if you get a sort of very big multifamily building uh, with the number of dwelling units, like larger than, I don't know, eight, 10, then you get big, bigger maximum amounts to be financed. And there you really uh, um, achieve a very, very big uh, performance for the building because you can benefit of a very big amount to be uh, paid on all these driving measures and the same applies for the driven measures. So you have like 50,000 euros per dwelling unit for the windows plus shutters. So electric charging stations, building automation system, uh, integrated storage system, new PV system and so on. Uh, but still people wanted everything for free. Uh, and there are still people uh, who complain um, achieving big performances after the retrofit um, in front of, a, I don't know, a, a, ma a maximum um, work amount of around half a million euros and they have to pay 30,000 euros and they complain because, because it's not for free. Uh, and this is, I mean, what came out uh, from this uh, incentive. So we have also very nice and big ma uh, maximum amount for the seismic uh, character, for the seismic measures, for instance, almost 100,000 euros per dwelling unit. If you want to uh, make the, the seismic classes two classes better than the existing uh, situation, which is a very nice and promising measure. I leave then all the references in the slides afterwards. So how to get this financial support? This is very important. Uh, you can get it uh, by tax deduction from the income tax return in five years, or uh, if you don't pay enough taxes uh, you can ask the suppliers, so the construction company typically to make a sort of discount on the invoice and then get back the money from the state afterwards. Or uh, if the suppliers don't want to go this way, you can also sell the credit, like assigning it to somebody, uh, to somebody else, to some financial uh, intermediaries, to some banks and so on. And they'll get them the, the money back from the state uh, in five years in their turn. A sort of free market of the credits. This was the uh, general pictures and it sound, uh, sounded very, very promising. But of course, we are in Italy, everything is cheating, everybody is cheating, trying to cheat and try to commit fraud. So in order to avoid uh, frauds and to uh, address the correct prices for materials and for technical activities, three assessments uh, are required. So first of all, when determining the bill of quality, the designer must comply with a very well-known Italian reference price list. So the engineer's uh, pr reference price list. So you couldn't um, address, I don't know, say th this heat pump cost, uh, I don't know, 30,000 euros uh, against, I don't know, the 6,000 or 8,000, which is currently sold on the market. 
just in order to get back more money from the state. This, is, this is, was not allowed. And of course, also materials prices must comply with this uh, Italian reference price list. Uh, so concerning the technical activities also from our side as technicians, we couldn't say, okay, I just want 100,000 euros uh, as a technical um, um, invoice uh, for this um, single family house. I mean, this, this was not possible, of, of course. And also, we technicians must comply with the calculation of fees of the Ministry of Justice. There's a decree, uh, and also these prices are uh, strictly defined. Uh, so the designer in this case must address and must say as a guarantee person, uh, these two things, materials and technical activities uh, comply with this reference price lists. And another thing, so from the financial point of view, uh, we also need a seal of approval of a qualified accountant. So we have two guarantee persons, so designers and, and accountants who uh, can say, okay, everything uh, has been done uh, legitimately and legally, no frauds. So just to make it simpler, uh, there's a guy who wants to invest uh, 100 euros for the works and he doesn't pay so much taxes, so he, he cannot deduct it from the income tax return. So he decides to sell it to the bank and the state will give it back 110%. So he decides to give 100 euros to the bank. Uh, these 100 euros are guaranteed by designer and accountant and the bank gives back 100 euros cash. So it's 110 potential, uh, 110 euros become 100 euros. He's fine, he's happy because he can do the job. And uh, from the side of the bank, the bank receives 100 euros credit who sells to the, to the states and gives back 110 uh, euros cash. So he gets 10% margin. That's the, 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 the situation explained a little uh, easier. So what had been doing uh, before uh, the super bonus came into play as an institute, as a passive house institute for, for, for research? So we made the research, but we followed a lot of projects in Italy. So for instance, office buildings, hotels, ground schools, skyscrapers, so retrofit of the skyscrapers, multifamily buildings besides several residential buildings, kindergartens, multifunctional buildings, biosphere, one and two, two passive house roaming modules, two experiments which we brought around Italy in order to show uh, the how showcase how passive house works, that it works in all possible conditions, like at the Mount Blanc uh, feet in January or on the seashore uh, on the Adriatic coast in August. Uh, very nice. Then super bonus came. Just look on the top right uh, how the Italy populates with this project. So this was the first project uh, in the market region. Then this was in Tuscany. This was in Lombardia. This was again on the coast, uh, which is going to be built uh, at the moment. Then we had another one in Veneto, which is also going to be built, currently be built in um, at the time. So another one in uh, Lombardia, another one in Trentino, again, 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 again. So I just wanted to put them all here in order to understand also myself what we did until now since 2020. So we got this 21 uh, projects. And if you look at them, they are pretty similar. So there's just one, two, two story buildings, uh, residential houses, no schools, no other kind of buildings. So actually the super bonus, when after super bonus came, the differ differentiation vanished completely. So it's just residential, residential, multifamily buildings. So we couldn't address these kind of multifamily buildings because of course you have a lot of hats uh, that must agree on the measures to be done. Uh, this one, below right right below is in rome we are maybe lucky that we get it 
uh, end of the month, but I'm not that positive. So it's very difficult to work with multifamily buildings, even though the maximal amounts are very big. So you, you, you will end up with passive houses everywhere. Uh, think about it. But of course, it's, I mean, it's a matter of uh, documents, of everything is bureaucracy and so on. So a very robust procedure, right? So very nice. Uh, but somebody thought it would have been easier to get money uh, from other minor uh, incentive schemes, like 90% from the bonus facade, like the bonus for the facades. Uh, you don't get the 100% back, uh, like in the super bonus, but you just you are fine if you get 90%. Why this? Because of no control on the lower incentives. And of course, frauds began to be uh, documented and half of them were really due to the bonus facade because no control. And everybody was claiming to have done a lot of work. They just uh, claimed to get a lot of money back from the state, like billions of euros back, really frauds that you can really think about. And uh, works had even not uh, even not begun, uh, just claimed on the paper. And uh, Draghi, our prime minister, is always complaining that uh, super bonus uh, has a, a big responsibility for these frauds and so on. But if you look closer to it, it's just three percent because it was a very robust scheme. But because of this. Uh, the government decided to introduce a lot of big modifications in order to prevent frauds, uh, either on the super bonus measure, as well as on the uh, credit assignment mechanism. Uh, and what- Frances Francesca, you've had 20 minutes. So can you wrap up in four? Yes, minutes? it's just three slides okay. and I'm over. Fantastic. Yes, fine. Thank you so much. No, thank you. For, for, for telling me this. So with this uh, modifications led to a complete blockage of the system now in Italy. And because we cannot assign the, 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 the credit to anybody because the state, the government is still uh, looking around how to prevent frauds. And uh, Draghi at the European Parliament in May uh, this year, so he just he just said we may not agree on the 110 percent super bonus tax incentive, and we do not agree uh, on the validity of this measure uh, because the 110 percent scheme removes the incentive for price negotiation. So all the prices went up because they said, okay, if there's a reference price list, perfect, I get the maximum which is corresponding to the same uh, amount stated in the price list. Uh, of course, he's not right because, in fact, according to the press, you can see that um, the improvement the, the, in the building sector was like 16% in 2021, and uh, more than uh, one third of our GDP uh, grew a growth rate in 2021 was due to the construction sector. So not bad, in fact, and a lot of incentives and the interventions was made. Uh, but this year, just to the fact that these big modifications and so on went on, uh, our retrofit investment fell down totally, fell down totally, uh, almost 10% uh, less. And moreover, uh, almost 33 thousand construction companies are almost bankrupt because the money doesn't come back even though i mean they did everything right but this mechanism of assignment of credit stopped and money does doesn't flow back and the likely uh, 150 thousand jobs are uh, about to disappear so what we learned from this so correctly promote the financial support and disinformation leads to wrong expectations. Like everything for free is not right and not true. Set an independent country body to assess the correctness of procedure. Well, even documented through visual inspections on site because people claimed works had been done, it was not true. 
or and set a lower percentage for the tax credit, maybe 80, 90 percent, just because it's not for free and, and, and people are being engaged in uh, putting some of their money in the intervention. Let the incentives run for the same period in order that people uh, get used to the mechanism and avoid to change, change, change everything and publish facts and corrective and interpretation and whatever, because it this brings uncertainty. The mechanism of assignment of credit looks like a super innovative and promising solution, uh, but of course, limitations may, may happen if something were to happen, uh, but this should be an exception, not the rule. And uh, the last thing is binding the maximum prices for material to a certain reference list avoids uh, that people not increase uh, the, the prices, but on the other hand, uh, avoid the negotiation on the prices. So this is what we have been doing so far. So consultancy training, research and development certification. And I want to finish with Mahatma Gandhi's quote like, be the change you want to see in this world. And uh, thank you for uh, your action. Thank you for your great, uh, this great opportunity to uh, spread the word uh, around. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you so much, Francesco. You can take a breath now. <laughs> <laughs> Breathe, yeah, and that, that was fascinating. I, I found that really interesting. Um, I, I'd love us to be able to explore more, but we're going to go straight on and we're going to move a little somewhat north and we're going to move to France. Um, and to say, if you have questions for, Fran for Fran any of the three speakers, put them in the chat. Mark very clearly it's a short question and we'll see if we get to them. I don't know if we're going to or not. So Marion, I'm going to come to you uh, as a, and you've been looking at the new legislation in France. And uh, I know as a native French speaker, you actually have been able to translate it, I think. So anyway, I'm going to pass over to you to introduce uh, the work going on in France. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chris. Um, so uh, I'm an architect and I specialize in uh, low energy design and retrofit in particular. And I've been looking at this topic for the last 10 years, um, but mostly in the UK because I've been here for 20 years. So um, uh, yes, I had the opportunity through this webinar, I suppose, to do a bit more research about what's actually happening in my home country. Um, so this is what I'm gonna to present to you today. So it's the best of my understanding of the mechanism in, that, that is in place in France right now to roll out retrofit on mass throughout the country. Uh, so you'll recognize lots of, you know, a similar system across countries, uh, but somewhat uh, with variations. So first, in France, um, there is now a law um, that has been passed actually in, um, in 24th of August, 2021, which is called the Loi Climat, Climate Law, uh, which uh, is sort of a blanket law that affects every single area of um, people's life across France um, and uh, with the aim of reducing carbon emission and be more sustainable generally. So it's really something that sort of try to link up all the actions from different departments across uh, the French government and, and various uh, activities and public services also. So it's, it's really an overarching um, uh, law, which is very important. Um, I thought I would just put a few highlights here uh, about what's coming this year, just to illustrate how it's spread through everything across uh, French activities. So first, for example, in 2022, uh, the six, some of the six um, implications um, of this law will be um, that outdoor heaters that you find outside cafes, for example, is now forbidden. So it's, it's a great waste of gas and, and totally unnecessary um, carbon emissions. So that's one, one of the first measures. And then another one is no more internal flights in France. France is a big country and you can fly from one end to another, but you, we also have a um, very fast TGV train, which I'm sure you've heard about. So if you can do a distance in train in less than two and a half hours, flights are now banned for that distance. So um, I think this is a great move. 
Um, the other one is uh, no more display of energy ratings on cars because that is seen as somewhat, of, of petrol cars in particular, somewhat um, uh, unproductive to incentivize people to decarbonize their lives. So this is now forbidden as well. Um, the advertising of fossil fuel is now also banned completely. So no more advertising for um, petrol stations or petrol types, et cetera, also. There is a freeze on rent increases for all dwellings of, with an EPC or F or G, uh, and I'll come back into that. And also there is now an obligation of energy audit for EPC dwellings of F, F or G. So this is just that a few measures that illustrate a little bit how widespread that law can have across various activities in the country. Um, so the energy audit, uh, so that started a little bit like in the UK quite a few years back in 2006. Uh, but now in uh, 2022, all the homes rated APC of F or G will need to have an energy audit uh, for all the dwellings that are up for sales. So if you sell a dwelling, you obviously have to have this EPC but it's a little bit more detailed than just the A4 size of, spread, um, of A4, sorry, <laughs> sheet of A4. It's actually a full-on diagnosis, and I'm gonna come back on, on it in a minute. Um, and this, this is now law from 1st of September, 2022. This energy audit is, is legally binding uh, for all the sales document, and that represents 4.8 million homes in France. So you could see that straight away, we are really, turning into a mass action for, for either these, these dwellings, at least in communicating um, a plan for retrofitting these homes. Uh, so the diagnostic is a little bit like the EPC in the UK, um, and it has the energy consumption and the CO2 emission as well. It, you also need to prove maintenance of all the services a recommend, recommendation of improvement for the indoor air quality, a recommendation for optimizing the internal comfort of the property in winter and in summer in a passive way. So it, it's, it's um, yeah, relatively similar to the EPC in the UK uh, with a few, a few differences. Um, and I like the metric, uh, which is the final energy, which we also call energy use intensity, in kilowatt hour per meter square per year. So that's very good to be able to compare different dwellings uh, together. Okay, the legal changes. This diagnostic, which is this sort of uh, EPC, is now opposable, if that's a word, uh, which means that um, if it is uh, false, uh, if it is false, it, you could take the sales or the owner who sold the property to court and um, challenge to have the funds paid to you to carry out the works that would have been um, the performance that the EPC had given you at, at the sale. So for example, if somebody sells you a, a house with an EPC of B, but in practice you realize that it's only an EPC of G, then you can request the funds to retrofit uh, the property to uh, what you thought you'd bought. So that's also a bit of a change. Um, the energy audit um, includes um, the, uh, the assessment of the performance of the building and the energy and carbon emission, uh, proposes improvement measures that would not be disproportionate to the value of the asset. It's a step, it also proposes step-by-step -step improvement, which I think is really interesting in a succession of coherent and complementary proposed work to obtain an energy efficiency of EPCB, also uh, include cost estimate and a future energy bills. Um, the energy audit delivery, so the government's also looking at um, um, training people en masse to produce uh, these documents and these, these audits, um, and um, yeah, is focusing on, on, on training professionals um, to, to create these accredited professionals to carry out these assessments. And also you will see later on manage these retrofits. 
So the government is working uh, in an eye, aligning all the meth methods of assessment and financing and incentive from government um, to have this retrofit happen across the board. Um, so landlords obligations. So uh, from 24th of August, it will be prohibited to increase the rents of dwelling FNG, which is this circa 5 million dwelling but also to index uh, the rents of these dwellings. So you won't be able to ever increase it in the future. The situation will be frozen for the, what we call in French, thermal sieves. So it's um, yeah, very um, uh, poorly efficient uh, dwellings. From 2025, it will be forbidden to rent an accommodation classified as G. In 2028, F and 2034E. So there is a similar progression in the UK also. Um, what also I find really interesting is they, they are asking for all communication to be user-friendly graphics in their recommendations. So it's easily understandable. So no more complicated or enormous 50-page um, document that no one understands. So some of the graphics you could see on the left-hand side. Tenants right, if the owner or the landlord has not done the necessary work to remove the accommodation from the worst category or to move it away from these inefficiencies, the tenant may force the owner to have the work carried out, request a reduction in his rent and ask for damages. So that is really quite um, a motivator for anybody uh, uh, renting any properties in France, I would have thought, as the risk is now becoming a lot, um, a lot more than what it is right now. So, um, so hopefully that that will definitely be a strong incentive for retrofitting. Um, so, what is the government also doing as incentive measures? So, there is what we call la prime énergie, which is a, a sort of bonus energy bonus, um, which is a, a, a grant, I suppose. So it's for the insulation of attic walls and floor, uh, changing a heating system. It is open to all household occupying a dwelling built for at least two years. So you can retrofit a three-year-old house, which is quite interesting. Hopefully you don't have to, but uh, for low-income household, aid can be enhanced with various other measures. And the maximum is 4,000 euros for that measure. Um, so for a heating system, you can see that you have different levels of help and depending on your income, um, you will have a varying amount of help. So for example, uh, if you have, if you want to replace your, um, your heat pump or you install a heat pump, they will give you up to 4,000 euros if you are a low income household and only 2,500 for other households. And uh, it is worth also noting that from the 1st of, of, 1st of July, 2022, the fuel and coal central heating system will be banned. So you will still be able to obviously operate one, but you will not be able to purchase a heating system that functions on fuel and coal. Other incentive is, um, a per square meter uh, grant, which is 20 euros per square meters towards the insulation of uh, roof and floors and uh, yeah, roof and floors. Again, you have different price depending on the household income. Um, wall insulation and rights to oversell. I thought it would be as an architect important to point this out is there is something that is called the droit de surplomb, which means that you can install an external wall insulation uh, over someone else's property, ground, without having to gain their consent, to seek their consent. And that is a law, and I'll put the code here, just to be very clear. And the limit is three, um, 350 mil, 35 centimeters. Um, there is a comp compensation that you could pay. There is no price. Uh, if you don't agree, you have to go to court and negotiate it with judge. Uh, but otherwise, it's left to the neighbors to agree between themselves. And uh, you can see the little cartoon here, which the French press have kind of um, reacted on this measure, saying um, 
you know, the, the women say to, to the man, uh, one meter 80 of external wall insulation is a little bit excessive, uh, considering the limit is 35 centimeter. And he reacts saying, yes, but I, I added acoustic insulation so that I can't hear them claim for um, compensation, I suppose. Anyway, <laughs> just uh, to say that it's making also the comedians react, which is nice to see. Then you have another, another uh, measure incentive, which is la prime rénov. Um, it can be accumulated with the grants that we just looked at. And it is a zero interest rate uh, loan. This time it's a loan as opposed to a grant. And it's up to 50,000 euros, which um, it should, only, should be up to 50% of the retrofit cost and must achieve a minimum of 35% energy improvement on completion. Uh, so that is really definitely a, a, a fantastic incentive and you can pay it back over um, 20 years. So that's also really quite, quite attractive, I have to say. Um, together with that, uh, the VAT of all the works related to retrofits are, have a maximum of 5.5%. So that's quite a difference also from the UK where a window will be at 20% still. Uh, the aid is conditional uh, on the carrying out of the work by a professional called a recognized guarantor of the environment. So it's, it's somebody, uh, I suppose, like the past 2035 uh, or the retrofit coordinator in the UK. And you see in, in, uh, on the left-hand side, the little graph here, that the average uh, loan uh, from 2021 was 20,700. So it, it is getting momentum. Uh, so it's good to see that. So yes, just um, something to dream about. 50,000 euros at 0% interest. I hope the government is listening. 5.5% uh, VAT, fantastic measures. Um, there's also some tax credits per element. So I haven't listed them all but I've just taken the, the, um, the measure on windows and the tax credit available a little bit like um, Francesco was talking about in Italy, I suppose, is you can offset this to on your tax um, and it's 15% on your income tax, 15% of the cost of the works for the windows with a maximum of 100 euros per windows, but it's still really great incentive. And finally, um, there is also something which I think is a good idea, which is um, a quote, a reno coach, which is somebody um, in each of the regions, there will be some sort of a, um, a, cent or a center or network of renovation experts. And you go to that center online, which is on the government website, you type your regional code, and they will direct you to a team of coaches who will look at your case and follow you throughout your retrofit plan. Um, so I think this is really important because a lot of people don't know where to go, where to start, who to ask what. And, and that structure um, is, uh, is really instrumental in being able to give people confidence that they're going to the right place and they're not going to uh, talk uh, to a charlatan who's going to um, yeah, uh, uh, charge them three times the price. So, so this is really a, a, an interesting, um, an interesting arrangement. And this is done in uh, in, in uh, collaboration. The government collaborates with private consultants who are approved by the states, but appointed by local authorities. So um, it's, it's difficult to do a retrofit and uh, we're not all experts and a lot of people are on a le huge learning curve. So a, a good team of, of helpers and Renov coach is much welcome. And merci, thank you very much for listening. I hope you find it of interest and inspiring and that you will be able to uh, lobby the government to implement perhaps in the UK some of these policies. Thank you. Merci, Marion. Thank you so much. That was another fascinating, you know, just when you're working in this area of retrofit and you see these examples, I know you both, Francesco and Marion, you've had to rush through this a bit, but it's just so interesting to see this and to see what, you know, what, what other, what 
governments that well con countries are doing and what they're learning what they're learning is doing wrong as well as you did francesco and, and marin that some of, some of that is it's just fascinating and uh, i certainly want to go through the slides again and, and really understand a bit more so they will be available in due course um right i need to keep going um we now jump a little bit uh we're going to get even wetter and colder and we're moving to ireland um uh, I, I love the thing about the flights as well. I've just come back on TGV from a very well from Spain, actually, just over the border. Yeah, I mean, and banning internal flights, wonderful. Anyway, right, Matthew, we're going to talk about Ireland and super homes. And I know you've been over there. I know you've had a trip, and you've become a UK expert on the subject. So, uh, hand over to you for um, to hear about that. Thank you. Great. Thanks very much, Chris, and thanks for Marianne for a very interesting talk as well. It's it's actually interesting to see how France and Italy and Ireland are all taking their approach to retrofits. Um, as Chris said, this is the story of the people that we met. There are three of us went over to visit the super homes and the retrofits in Ireland. Uh, we took a camera crew with us. Uh, no video footage yet, but there will be shortly. So. Um, there we go. So, first of all, retrofit can be scary. So there's a picture of JAWS, you've got untried systems, what about damp and mould, retrofit's very hard to cost, you have the occasional cowboy contractor, um, heat pumps don't always deliver what you need. The old thing in building, if it's hidden, it's probably bodged. So retrofit can be scary. And whoops, da, 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 da. Uh, I'm doing getting rid of that. Um, uh. Technical problem? Yes, technical problem. Oh, yes, there we are. It's right. Yes, so customer care is key. So it's a very, it's very difficult. So um, you really want to look after the customers. And the other thing is, if you just do single measures, um, we actually visited when we were over there, um, a chap called Michael, who is a fantastic accordion maker. And Cameron and I were very, very jealous of his workshop. He, a few years ago, had had some wall insulation done in his home. So we visited his home to see what retrofit looks like. But... He'd had the wall insulation done, but he hadn't had the room and the roof done, and he was still using an oil boiler. So although he'd done retrofit, he actually was ready for a one-stop shop deep retrofit to finish the job. So there's a massive difference between the deep retrofit where you look at the whole thing and single measures. So Michael was an example of single measures and deep retrofit is really what's wanted. So in Ireland, deep retrofit starts off with what is a deep green home? Now, super homes is a fantastic name, but it is also trademarked. Um, it's owned by Electric Island Super Homes, which is one of the one-stop shops. So um, it's all about the customer journey and to support the customer in achieving their deep retrofit, you have a one-stop shop and the one-stop shop looks after the people, the process, the suppliers and the money. So all of that is done um, for the customers. So we spoke to a number of people, um, and this is really the story of the people that we met. Um, one of the people was Nazreen, and Nazreen is from Canada. Her partner is Irish. Because she was used to Canada, she's used to warm homes um, and warm homes that stay warm. The, the um, one-stop shop scheme that Ireland runs you have to get to a B2 rating. So the energy ratings in Ireland are slightly different to UK, but they're very similar. They talk about BERA, which is like passive house, and B2, which is pretty good. Um, you have to get to a B2 if you want to go into the scheme. Because she was from Canada, she wanted to get to an A rated, so she added MBHR and some other little tweaks. The one-stop shop engineers talk to the customer. So Nazarene had the engineers from One Stop Shop come around to their house, have a look at the house and decide what she wanted to do. So she wanted to go to a higher rate. There's still more grants because the more you do, the more money you get, but the more you have to pay yourself. 
But the big thing is that the one-stop shop selects and supervises the contractors. So they make it very easy for the customer. And the customer's hand is held throughout the retrofit process. We spoke to Mark. Um, so Mark has an insulation company. Um, that's Mark with his um, expanded polystyrene external wall insulation cutter. He's got a very nice um, hot wire cutter, which gives you super um, accurate joints, which gives you a good quality job. He has visibility of work, so he can invest in equipment and people. Ireland have got a 10 year fund for doing retrofit. So it doesn't matter what political party is happening. Similar to France, there was a citizens assembly that looked at climate change and the policies that the citizens assembly proposed were taken into practice. And in fact, the citizens assembly came around an early version of the one stop shop. So Tipperary Energy Agency had the um, members from the climate assembly come around so they could understand what it was about. And they said, yes, yeah, it's a great idea. Let's do it. So they are. Um, an example is the insulation which they put up in Ireland goes right up between the sockets into the rafters. So you get continuity of insulation between the wall and the um, roof insulation. So the, the normal problem that you get with um, thermal, uh, poor thermal um, insulation at the joint in the wall and the ceiling, that's done. And um, Mark also takes lots of photos. So he takes lots of photos while he's doing the job so that when the one-stop shop engineers come around and check up, he can show them the photos to show it was done properly. The one-stop shop go around about three or four times during the retrofit to make sure that the quality is okay. Um, the bottom one, we've got Cameron stood outside a council house. Um, council homes, council tenants can get a retrofit done for free, which is actually what Insulate Britain were after. So Cameron has stood outside a row of about 50 semi-detached houses. The one is outside has been finished. The one next door has not, which is why there's a gap. Uh, there's a step in the, um, in the wall. What they do is they offer it to everyone. And then I have some early adopters who are happy and they say, yeah, this is great. I don't mind a bit of disruption because I'm going to have a really nice, comfortable, warm house and it's not going to cost much to heat. Other people are going to say, well, no, this is all new. I'm not quite sure about this. So, so that's fine. And what happens is over a year or so, they gradually work down the street and everyone, you know, almost everybody goes for it because you can see the qualities there. So um, the industry is growing in Ireland. The retrofit industry is really growing nicely. So we then spoke to Paul from Solar. So Paul was one of the contractors. So the one-stop shop are the designers, uh, they're the equivalent of the retrofit coordinator, but it's the contractors who actually do the job. So there's a good relationship between the one-stop shop and the contractors, because it's the contractors, so it's the one-stop shop who say, in discussing with the customer, we think you want to have new windows, or we think your windows are okay, but they might need resealing, or, or whatever it is. So it means that when the contractor is going around to see the customer, the customer already understands what they're letting themselves in for. They already know that it's going to be a 30,000 or an 80,000 euro job because the one-stop shop has told them what they need and roughly how much it's going to be. So when the contractor puts their price in, the price is normally very close to the estimate that the one-stop shop has given them. So as I say, it's the contractors who actually deliver the retrofit. The one-stop shops don't have any tradesmen. The retrofit um, contractors have their own tradesmen and then they'll employ people. So Paul employed Mark to do the external wall insulation, but Paul's own men would have done some of the refitting windows or putting in underfloor insulation or whatever it happens to be. Um, they do work around the, the customer it depends on the degree of retrofit. So the house that we're looking at there was a big rip out. They took the floors up, put insulation under the floor. You're not going to live in that house. But they had another example where they had an 80 year old woman um, and the full retrofit was done with her living in the house. She had one day where she had to move out of her ordinary um, home. 
But that is because it was external wall insulation, which is obviously a lot easier than internal wall insulation. So the contractor works around the customer very closely to make sure the customer is happy. Um, two photos there, you've got Paul with the hot water tank and you can see by his knee the underfloor heating manifolds. So it's all standard stuff. And outside is the eight kilowatt um, air source heat pump, which was used for heating that house. 2000, sorry, 200 um, square metres for about 2,000 square foot home, four bedroom detached house. He thought he would have probably just about got away with a five kilowatt heat pump because it's so well insulated. Um, and the trust between the contractors and the one-stop shop gradually grows over time because they're working very closely together. It's the same contractors tend to work with the same one-stop shop. They have to look after each other. They're both looking after the customer. So the one stop shot that we visited was Electric Island Superhomes. And at the top, you can see the three of us, there's Richard, me and Cameron uh, meeting up in their offices. So the one stop shop is the life belt for the customer. They're the trusted partners guiding them through the shark infested waters of retrofit. Um, the chap on the right, Declan, is the ops manager. So he looks after the surveyors and the engineers. They're the people who go out, see the customer, um, sell the job, uh, let them know about it, educate them, but they also supervise. Um, they manage the whole process, including the quality assurance. I've said about the photos, so there's photos that the tradesmen take, but then electrical and super homes also, the one-stop shops, also take photos. And they're audited by SEAI, Sustainable Energy Ireland, sorry, the Sustainable Energy Authority of Ireland. Um, which is the government department that looks after all of energy efficiency stuff. The, um, the one-stop shop also applies for the grants. Again, it's all about making the customer's life easy. So there's no form filling for the customer. That's all done by the one-stop shop. The one-stop shop collects the funds and it's about 40 to 50% up to 35K. So most people are saying it's, you know, retrofit, deep retrofit is going to cost you 50 to 100,000 decent grants from the Irish government. The reason they're putting that level of grant in is because from their earlier trials, they understand you need that sort of level of grant to get people to adopt. And the big job for the one-stop shops is to develop the contracts, is to deliver it. There are 17 one-stop shops around Ireland. So there's 17, they tend to be regional, um, but Electric Island Superhomes um, looks any, anything up. This does about three counties. So uh, we also met a um, chap called Declan, who is a quantity surveyor, project manager, and architect. So we were talking to him about so how's the building industry changed in Ireland over the last few years. And the first thing he pointed out, obviously, is that all new builds are nearly zero energy buildings. So Ireland have adopted the, um, I think it's, I'm not sure is it A or B, but it's, it's a very low energy buildings. Um, that's what we couldn't do in England because it was too hard. What he pointed out is that if you have a BERA rated home, it sells faster and it sells for a higher price. So in, it, in Ireland, people understand about passive house, energy efficient houses, um, and they're prepared to pay more for them and they'll buy them sooner because they're comfortable and they're cheap to run. It's the same for houses for rent. If you've got a house for rent, if it's A rated, it sells, it, it rents out faster and it rents out for more. So although Declan sort of works alongside a bit the one-stop shops, he also has their own private clients. And one of his clients he was working with is looking at renovating some um, redundant retail units in a small town. So traditional problem. Now, rather than doing a cheap job and just ramming in as many flats as they could, this developer said, I'm going to make them A-rated homes. I know it's going to cost a bit more. They're going to be nice flats. They're going to be really nice and comfortable to live in. They're going to let out really easily. And because they're doing that, that part of the town is then going to be a nice place because nice flats, which are desirable, tend to attract nice people. And you put a nice coffee shop in there and you've suddenly got town renovation 
all for free. BERA is coming on to being expected. So the graph at the bottom is um, the number of, um, that's the reports which Ireland and all the other European countries do for how many of their housing stock is in the different categories. Um, the link on there is, you can see it. When you do that same thing for UK, the UK has got fewer of the F and Gs, but they got hardly any A's. You know, the, the A's don't even show up on the graph on the UK. So where's Nazarene going? Um, what's the destination? The, the house will be really comfortable all year round. It will cost hardly anything to heat. So um, in the autumn and the spring, she'll hardly need to have the heating on at all. Um, if they do have children, if she and her partner have children in the future, it's a zero carbon, so it's good for the kids' future. The, um, they obviously got a mortgage to buy a house. They, it's a big, deep retrofit, so they're not living it. The retrofit's going on while they're renting, and then it's, they're moving in afterwards. So they got a mortgage to buy the house. They got a grant for some of the work, the retrofit work, which obviously they, don't, they didn't have to pay for. And then they got a low-cost loan. Now, because you've got all the quality assurance, which goes with the one-stop shops, there's a lot more people willing to lend money to those projects. So there's actually quite a few funders who are willing to lend on a deep retrofit project. She's happy not only because she's going to have a house which is a bit better than her old one in Canada, but it's also going to be worth more than what it cost us then to buy, plus the net retrofit cost after the grant. So they're making money by retrofitting their house and they're going to end up with a nice house. So we have a happy customer, which is what it's all about. The other benefits, of course, um, it's a boost to the local economy. So most of the investment from these grants is going into local tradesmen or local companies. So it's good for the economy. It improves the balance of payments for Ireland because it hasn't got to spend as much money on importing fossil fuel. It reduces dependency on dodgy petro states. It stimulates other carbon savings because Ireland have a carbon tax. It's only 35 euros a tonne but it's gradually ramping up to 100 euros a tonne by 2030, I think it is. And they're using that money from the carbon tax to fund the grants for the retrofit. So no extra money needed, it's all coming from the carbon tax. It obviously helps reduce fuel poverty as well because um, anyone on benefits can get the housing done for pretty much nothing. So um, is it a no brainer, who can say? So a deep, retrofit, deep retrofit in Ireland, that's what it is. It's about getting to a deep retrofitted house. It's all about looking at the customer, looking after the customer through the one-stop shop um, with people, process, suppliers and money. And if you just look at what that means, what is the one-stop shop with the people, you've got the salesman, surveyor, project manager, designer, quality, that's all done within the one-stop shop people. So it's the retrofit um coordinator type thing the process they've got design guides some of those come from seai so the the standards that they have to work to are from seai they've got auditing they've got contracts with the contractors and with seai there's lots of recording it's thoroughly documented so you know maybe italy can look at some of this stuff because um, it's all nicely controlled they're working with the suppliers developing components approved component suppliers approved contractors there's a lot of work going into selecting and approving the contractors to make sure the job's good um, i think it's probably the contractors that sort out the tradesmen rather than the one-stop shop but you do need the whole network um, and obviously then you've got the money which is looking at the grants how that fits in with the low cost loans and the one-stop shop managing the cash flow for the whole thing because the customer only pays it at the end so there's a massive amount of work. It's not that easy. They've spent 10 years through different schemes gradually building this up. It's, it's working at scale now. So if anyone's wanting to copy this, um, a visit may well be worth it. So the question is not so much, um, can we learn from Ireland, but will we learn from Ireland? Um, so that, that's it. And the, the next step for us, is um, Cameron, Richard and I are wanting to get some influencers, some journalists, um, some people close to base, some architect professors, 
over to Ireland so they can see what we saw and they can help persuade and educate the government that maybe this is something which we could do as well. Mm. And that's me. Oh, thank you so much, Matthew. I just feel I've just had, I don't know, uh, you know, a huge amount of input in such a short time. So I'm just so grateful to all three of you for your inputs. And uh, there are a couple of questions I'm just going to pick up. And there aren't many. I think people are probably totally blown away, to be honest. Uh, well, that's my guess. Um, one is around VAT. Um, so we heard about a VAT reduction in France, Marion. Um, is there a VAT reduction in Ireland or Italy? Now, I know you answered for Italy, Francesco, and said there is no VAT reduction. Um, so, unfortunately. Um, is there in Ireland, Matthew? I'm not sure. Okay. Not putting you on the spot, I just thought it's an interesting question. I think mm -hmm. question should, should be would, though that, but yeah, it would seem to make sense, wouldn't it? And the other question, um, uh, Donna has raised uh, is um, around the quality assurance of the inspection, given that in this way that it's a little bit incestuous, the one stop shop. So they're, they're investigating their own work or, or monitoring their own work. I know SEAI are auditing. How do you that? You've got a number of different checks. Um, the work is being done by the contractor. Mm. It's the one-stop shop which is checking that it's being done properly. So the one-stop shop's a bit like a QS or... Um, so they're checking that the contractor is doing the right job. So that's one level of checks. Um, because ventilation is a potentially difficult area, then I think the... Um, the commissioning of the ventilation has to be witnessed by a third party. Right. And of course, you have SEAI who are doing um, their own audit checks of quality um, on top of that. So SEAI check each of the um, one-stop shops work. So there's a whole set, you know, all of the contracts and the checking and everything else um, is all part of the system. Right. Thank you. Um, and Donna, who raised that issue, actually has commented and said she thinks that it's the one-stop shop idea. It looks like the best solution I've seen in years, and I've been trying to figure out how, how to retrofit in the UK. And um, what, um, Francesca, what did you think about the one-stop shop concept? And, and how much do you think it links to what Italy have done? It's been done differently, hasn't it, really? Yeah, it's a slightly different method. Uh, which I really like. So I um, it, it somehow reminds me what Thomas and Leary were have been doing in the past years, also together with the city of Dublin there. Um, so sort of bringing people there, getting them to learn to to put hands on and to be assisted and supported by uh, by by consultants and by you know the processes that many was were, was referring there. So in the process for the people, for the money and so on. I mean this is very interesting. So um, actually we are somehow lacking uh, some of these columns, some of these pillars, like for instance uh, concerning the financial institutions. Um, everybody has to think about himself. Uh, it's very difficult to, uh, to find a third party um, uh, indication about what is really the best solution or how to get this or that finance, financial amount and so on. For instance, if you want to, to get a, a certain amount from a bank, um, uh, a credit from a bank, or from a financial broker or something like this, you have to help yourself. So you, there's no, no, no place where you go and you ask and you are supported for. So this is really missing. And I really do support this kind of uh, attitude. Like, I mean, we just support you and help you in whatever process and step of the renovation. Uh, we are trying to set it up in Italy, so through our communication, through our network, uh, and we are all cooperating together also with some other um, uh, energy body, such as uh, Casa Clima, for instance. So Clima House is another uh, very common 
um, energy energy scheme and energy energy label here in Italy. So building standards uh, like passive house. So we are all trying to cooperate all together in order to disseminate as precise as possible information to the um, to the customers. But I mean, it's it's a hard way. So yeah, this might it's... prevent frauds, right, Matthew? I mean, if you have a good a good support, a good control. I mean, I don't know if you are aware of uh, any any cheating or frauds which might be happening there. It's a good question. I, I, I don't know. Um, somebody else was asking how yeah. our contractors prices controlled. Yeah. Um, and it's a good question. Now, one thing is the customer has to, because the customer is paying a decent chunk of this work anyway. Um, the When the contractor gives the price to the customer, it's gonna be close to what the one-stop shop is expecting. However, they have about an 80% success rate. So there's a number of people who having had the survey and have having had the contract come around, they'll say, tell you what, no, we're not going to do it. It's not a blank check. It's a good question. I'm not sure what they've got in terms of standard pricing. And I don't know how they benchmark costs. I don't think they get one job priced by two or three contractors um, that they may well do. And obviously they've got a large number of jobs going on. You know, if you're doing one three bed house with a contractor A and another three bed house with contractor B, um, I think the one stop shop are gonna have a pretty good understanding of pricing. But I don't totally understand that mechanism. It will be a good thing to ask at another visit. Do you, Mary, do you think there's anything in, I mean, I was really struck in France by the coaching, uh, so I wrote it down, but uh, the renovation coach um, concept I thought was really interesting because that's the same thing everybody wrestles with, isn't it? How, how people start with this, you know? Um, so I'm just going to note that, but actually is there anything um to limit sort of excessive pricing in france do you think or is it just market uh... um i don't know i do not know um sorry, sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> just, just, i mean what, what's interesting with all of this is the commonality of all the problems every all of these schemes are wrestling with and they're different ways of trying to tackle it when I, mean, I know more about the island scheme because we talked to paul kenny matthew and i who is the uh, the government advisor who is basically the, the architect not a not a but architect designing buildings, an engineer, but, but the, the architect of this scheme really, who's been at it for 10 years researching and, and actually the thing that stands out in all of this is time scales and commitment and the fact that people start to know that this is going to happen and go on, um, which certainly I picked up I, some extent from all of it. Um, I think we are going to have to wrap up. I'm just wondering whether there's anything else to pick up on. Um, um, there was another question I think I missed. There was, there was a very interesting comment uh, about the citizens' assembly process. Obviously, coming out of that, in certainly in France and uh, mm -hmm. uh, well, and in Ireland, of course, and we had one here which was didn't result in anything. It wasn't picked up. And it's, in the end, it's all about degree of government leadership. I think, isn't it? Um, uh, I won't go further to comment on that, particularly at the moment in the UK. But uh, <laughs> and there was a, a question about cooling. Uh, which I think is a, probably a technical question. And we know that cooling, um, good retrofit, as in good new build, you, you kind of look at cooling, you look at what is needed to ensure you don't overheat. Mm -hmm. is it? Um, so I think perhaps we've no need to address that. So I think, oh, and a, a, lo a lovely comment here, if you haven't read it um, from David, um, I'm blown away, just astonished by what other countries are doing. and so disappointed our government understands little of any of this. And, uh, I think those of us sat here in uh, the, well, England, particularly, um, you know, would echo that. So I just want to, I'm going to, first of all, I want to thank the three of you. It's absolutely fascinating. I found it riveting, you know, being involved in this sector. So interesting. Thank you so much. I want to flag up with everybody that we hope to carry on running these webinars. There's going to be a, well, I think there's going to be a gap over the summer. 
we won't run, run one in August. I think Jill's nodding, so I think uh, I think I'm off the hook for that. Uh, hopefully, we'll bring another series back in the autumn, um, and we don't know what it's going to be in that yet. So I think on that note, um, there are more points coming up, but I can't read them and talk. So I'm going to hand over to Jill for the last sort of wrap up. Thank you and. Thank you everyone for attending. I hope, well, I'm sure you found it as interesting as I have. So over to you, Jill. Thank you very much, Chris. Yeah, no, absolutely a last wrap up. Just to say thank you so much to our, um, to our presenters this evening. Those, those were fascinating. We get locked into what goes on here or what doesn't go on here. And actually this thing's been trialed that we can just, um, you know, take so much from when we're lobbying our own government about, you know, what, what we can take forward, what, what, what looks like it's working, where the pitfalls are. So this is, I think, kind of fundamental work that one would hope the government was undertaking, but I suspect isn't. So it's important that, uh, that, that other people undertake it so that we can present it to them. Um, thank you very much, Chris. Yes, for seeing us through uh, the session so far. We will take a break over the summer. There will be a newsletter, which will include um, obviously the recording of today and the presentations and, uh, and any interesting news that may come up in the intervening period and there seems to be always interesting news at the moment so uh, we shall we shall see uh, what the next newsletter brings us but please uh, share the newsletter and subscription with any uh, with any colleagues you have and we will just try and build this uh, community of sharing information thank you very much for giving up a Tuesday evening and look forward to seeing you all in the autumn have a lovely summer thank you Jill. thank you thank you good thank you, night. Everybody. thank you very much. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Ciao. Thanks. Bye. Bye.